All right. So today we're going to start talking about um, the, the kind of an introduction to manufacturing, what the basic outline is. Um, Um, how you break up processes, different roles that are involved in, in, pro in production. So we'll talk about that stuff today. <coughs> so we have two main types of processing. What were they? Two main types. Yeah. Primary and secondary. Yeah, primary and secondary. So what's primary processing? So, primary processing is getting the raw materials. <clears throat> so, figuring out, okay, I need to make aluminum. How do I do that? Okay, I want to make paper. First, I need some wood. So, where do I get the wood? Uh, I want to make glass. I need, to, I need to find somewhere to, to get the material to make glass. And then I'll make some big sheets of glass. And then they take it to the window guy and he takes the big sheet. Now he does secondary operations to cut that down to the right size. <clears throat> so primary is doing the primary. So here's the primary process for aluminum. And everything from scratch. Take a look around, and you'll find this wonder metal everywhere. And everything from screen doors to jet planes. Aluminum has so many applications because it's light and strong, and it's corrosion and crack resistant. Producing aluminum is costly, but it saves money over time. Aluminum, so widely used today, and the world's most abundant metallic element does not occur in a natural state. The most available source of aluminum is actually bauxite. Bauxite is mainly mined in tropical countries. The aluminum atom in bauxite is bonded to oxygen molecules. These bonds have to be broken by electrolysis to produce pure aluminum. Bauxite is carried by rail to the plant where it will be crushed. Then, through a chemical transformation called the Bayer process, alumina is extracted. This is then roasted in calciners to eliminate all moisture. This is the reduction facility. This plant has 432 pots through which a powerful electric current will be passed to produce electrolysis. An overhead crane dumps alumina into the pots. Then, the electric current from the anode passes through the alumina that we see here at the bottom of the pot. Via the process of alumina reduction at 1742 degrees, the anodes lose volume and will have to be replaced. It's a continuous operation. Each anode has a lifespan of about 20 days. Spent anodes are recovered from the pot with this overhead crane and carried off to be recycled. They clean the aluminum rods which will then be reused. Here we see the crust formed atop the anode. When the anodes are replaced, the accumulated impurities have to be recovered from the top of the pots. This is accomplished with these pincers. Then a new anode is inserted into the alumina and electrolysis continues. The electric current breaks the molecular bonds. The heavier aluminum collects at the bottom of the pot, while the oxygen bound to fluorine is released as a gas, which is drawn off and treated. The liquefied aluminum remains at the bottom of the pot. It has to be recovered in this huge crucible with a tube. 
The tube is dipped into the bottom of the pot, and a vacuum system draws the molten aluminum from the crucible. The aluminum is recovered in a short time. Air is vacuumed from the crucible by a flexible pipe held by an operator. The tube is finally withdrawn, and the overhead crane dumps another quantity of alumina into the pot. Thus, the aluminum fabrication process continues uninterrupted. The crucibles filled with molten alumina are transported to the casting house. Their contents are poured into holding furnaces that have a capacity of 60 tons. In these very hot furnaces, the molten aluminum is stored to await casting. Finally, casting begins. The aluminum can be semi-continuously vertically cast, producing ingots, sheets, or billets, or it can be directly cast into semi-finished products. The cooling of aluminum pieces is accelerated by water sprays. The large rectangular ingots, which can weigh up to 25 tons, will head for hot rolling, and eventually will be fabricated into products like aluminum foil. From four to five tons of bauxite have produced two tons of alumina, which in turn produces one ton of alumina. This particular plant produces 200,000 tons of alumina annually. Some other facilities can turn out as much as 400,000 tons. So what are some other things that need to have a primary process done? What are some other primary processes? What? Okay. What? what? Can we count? Yeah, I already said that. Oh, I already said that. Uh, Oscar. You think of anything? I would say mining, but I don't know. That's yeah, so mining is a, that, that's a primary process used in a lot of things, right? <clears throat> so you have to get stuff out. So iron, um, to, then to make steel from, from iron. Aluminum they showed mining. Um, is, it, is it an ore when they take it out, a mining mm -hmm. ore? Yeah. So the so primary process is trying to get it ready to do something else with it. So now, from, like on the aluminum, <clears throat> when they finish that process, they have the ingots and, and the billets and stuff. Now they can go in and do secondary processes. And that's where we're going to spend most of the time this semester, talking about secondary processes. <clears throat> so what are some secondary processes? Like casting. Yeah, casting. Casting. Casting and molding. So what's the difference between casting and molding? Cast is, uh, if you have something made, you can fill the void with whatever material, right? Mold does kind of the same thing, though, too, right? <clears throat> Usually when we talk about metals, we say casting. talk about anything else, we say molding. But it's basically the same type of processes. You have an empty space, you fill it with something. Yeah. It's just how you do that. And you can do the same type of thing with both, but usually... Say casting, we're talking about something metal. Kind of molding, usually it's plastics or ceramics or something like that. <clears throat> we have forming. So it's taking something that's in kind of the rough shape and bending it or pushing it or it's like with aluminum, that's primary. We make an aluminum can. We get a sheet, we stamp it down and make a can out of it. So that's forming. Or you do sheet metal, we bend stuff up. Or you do pipe bending or or punching or so make a car, they take a flat sheet, they punch it to make the shape that they want. They just take it and kind of bend it a little bit or extrude it, like play doh to get to get the shape they want. <clears throat> Separating. So what's that? In the other that separates stuff. It takes one piece and makes it more than one piece. 
cutting. Anything else? Oil. What? Oil. Oil. Yeah, oil. Separating oil. But even within cutting, there's lots of little things within cutting, right? So the cutting is not just scissors. But what other kind of things cut? Cut materials. Saws. Uh, yeah, a shear, uh, drill, right? That cuts. A mill, a lathe. Water gun. Yeah, a, a water jet, a, a laser, a plasma cutter. They're taking one piece, making it more than one piece. Sometimes the little the other pieces are little tiny things, right? Right? Drills and mills. You have one big piece, then you make a lot of little pieces. <clears throat> so that's separating. You know, conditioning. So, what's that? What's conditioning? Not air conditioning. Finishing of the product? Yeah, kind of finishing, making it in the properties more like what you want. So, with a steel, right, you have some steel that's pretty soft, some steel that's pretty hard. It all starts out the same, just different elements in it. But you can have some steel, you can make it real soft, and you can make that same steel really hard. So how do you do that? What? Even the same carbon content. You can make it really soft or really hard. What? Yeah, tempering it. So tempering it is the process of heat treating it and bringing it back down and kind of normalizing this thing. So the whole heat treat process. So you do what's called annealing, which is you heat it up real hot. You let it cool down really slow. So you, so you heat it up in a furnace. You put it in a thing of sand. Let it cool down in a thing of sand. It takes a long time to cool down. But you get it out, you can bend it with your hand almost. <laughs> Depending on what it is and how thick it is. But it's really, you can take it with a pair of pliers and do whatever you want with it. It's real flexible, but it's not real strong, right? You can do the same thing, put that same piece in. The furnace, get it hot, take it out, drop it in a bucket of water or ice water even, and it gets really hard, it's really tough, but what else is it? Brittles. Really brittle. So then they'll do, do tempering, which they'll heat up a little bit to kind of get some of the brittleness out. <clears throat> so that kind of conditioning, or some chem chemical conditioning, so like galvanizing it. Now it's a little bit more resistant, um, stuff like that. So change some of the properties of it so that it does more what you want it to do. <clears throat> Assembling stuff, so putting more than one thing together. We talked about a few ways to do that, right? We can weld it, we can glue it, we can fasten it, we can braise it. So, lots of different ways you can put stuff to back together again. And sometimes you'll do assembling before or after some of these other processes. You might put it all together and then cut it. Then it goes through, through separating. So it's not just step one, step two, step three, step four. You can kind of go back and forth wherever you want. And then there's finishing. Does finishing have to be at the end? No. Is it always at the end? Or is it usually at the end? Yeah. Depends, depends on what you're thinking about. If you're talking about just one part, then yeah, it's probably at the end. But if you're talking about an assembly, usually you finish it and then you put it together. Especially with something that's bolted together. It's like these tables. <clears throat> the sub assembly's on the back, that little little piece like that on the back. That was assembled, then finished. But then the, then that was used in another assembly again. So they're gonna be assembled, finished, assembled again. So that's a sub assembly, right? Yep, sub assembly. So we do that a lot. So the legs, each leg is a subassembly. And actually, have, each leg has two subassemblies in that leg, the top part and the bottom part. <clears throat> and usually we'll break the, the subassemblies up by kind of a grouping of, okay, it's going to do this process. I want to take all these things and do this process together. So that's a subassembly now. <clears throat> so now, different production areas. So different roles in a production environment. So they've always designed a product, 
Now what? Now they're going to have to go make it. Who do you think they talk to first? Let's think big production. You're going to make 10,000 of these things. Who are they going to go talk to? Marketing. Engineers. Yeah. They have, they have a manufacturing engineer. So they can help design the machines that are going to be used to make that final product. So you have one product, but then now you need to make a machine to make that product. Or you need to make a jig so that you always line it up right. Or a fixture or a die or something like that. And then you have the main manufacturing people. People that are running the machines, that are assembling things. And the bulk of the people are here in manufacturing, they're actually doing the work. Then what else? Assembly. That's part of manufacturing. That's, this is in your company, so you're going to buy the raw materials, already done, or, or even this could be the part of making the raw materials. So you could have someone design the process, someone that's actually doing it. What else? No, we're just talking about people that are involved in making it. That's given to someone else. There's still two more groups of people Designing involved. It? No, it was already designed way before this. Hopefully it was designed with the, with the people that are talking about. No, not packaging. That's after it's done. Yeah, there it is. You guys read the chapter? I read the first chapter. This is part of the second chapter. Yeah, I'm in the second part. This is the first part of the second chapter. Right. Okay. All right. Who else? So someone designs the machine to make it. Someone makes it. What do you have to make? What do you do after you make something? Package it. No. Before it that. Together. Before. Test it. Test it. Test it. Make sure the quality is like you want it. Make sure it's the right size. Make sure the parts are going to fit together, right? So quality control, that's our tolerances on our drawings. So they go and they get the part and they say, OK, this is what size it's supposed to be. This is the maximum, the minimum size it's allowed to be. It doesn't meet that. And then, the, and so they so go through and say, OK, yes, this one's good. Yes, this one's good. No, that one's bad. Yes, this one's good. And they'll make a little chart. this. And so it'll show kind of the, the mean size, so the middle size from their sample. So maybe they'll take 10 pieces out and measure all 10. They'll see what the range was for that 10 and see where the average size was. And so by working and working with production, maybe they might be able to narrow that down. So instead of having a lot of variation, they have less variation and less, getting more control over their process. And those processes are, you think that's a, a good, no. good job? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good job. It's about half above and half below the line. It's within the limits. So they're doing a good job. All those parts are good. What would be bad is if you saw parts, points going like that, or points going like that. Then that's out of control. It's not staying within a narrow area. It's all over the place, or it's trending up to a bad area. So they all might be good here, but then something's going to go bad up here. So you want to adjust the machine, or figure out what's going on to make it out of control. So the quality control people will kind of do that. They watch what's going on. Some companies inspect every single thing that comes off the line. So every piece out, off the end gets checked. Everything or it might get checked halfway through or at certain stages. Um, some companies make every person that does something, they have to check what was done before them to make sure that the person before them did it the right way. So now they're going to do their thing. And the person after them is going to check their stuff. So it's being checked at every step along the way and at the end. Some just do samples. So if you're making 50,000 things a day, 
you can't check every one. So maybe you'll pull 10 out every hour or 10 out every two hours, something like that. So you get a nice sampling of what's going on through the day so you can see where it is. And here, it's starting to go bad, and well, now, now it's really bad. So maybe we need to go adjust this stuff. <coughs> Questions? Great. Who else? And actually, this person kind of works all the way from here all the way to the end. So, that's person is going to sit here? No. It's the planning and control. So, quality control makes this chart. They get the data for this chart. And they give it to process control and planning. So, planning part, before they figure out, okay, we're going to do, we're going to, first we're going to, we're going to cast it. Then we're going to take it over to the mill and have this stuff machined on it. They'll take it over to the lathe, have this stuff put on it. We'll go to the finishing, it needs this paint. Um, then you guys need to put the stuff together, and then we'll package it. So they kind of plan out the processes and how it's gonna move through and when. So today you're gonna to do this. Tomorrow you're gonna to do this. At noon tomorrow you're gonna to switch over and start doing this. Because we need this many things at the end of the month. So they kind of plan it out. And then they take the quality control stuff and say, okay, this process is not working. But let's go back. We need to adjust that somehow. Okay. So the types of manufacturing. But what are the types of manufacturing? So. How often something is done? No. So, yeah, automated, that's, so that's continuous manufacturing, where they're always making it. The production line just runs that one thing 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Or it'll do something for a long time, and then they'll switch it out and do something else for a long time. They'll switch out and do something else for a long time. <clears throat> but it just kind of keeps going. What, what else? Seasonal. Yeah, seasonal. Or maybe they do 50 of these and 50 of those. Quantity. Shorter cycles. <clears throat> Intermittent. We might do one of this model, then one of that model. Kind of to, to fill orders. But you're not continually running it. <clears throat> and then, what's the, the lowest level? Man. Yeah, custom. I want this thing. Can you make that for me? Or I want 50 of these. I'm only going to have done this one time. Maybe again in a year or whatever. But it's not a standing order. It's not something that's done all the time. That's custom. So that's kind of been the way it's usually been. But then lately, the last few years, there's been another category come up. Actually, not lately, it's like last 10 years. Got another big category that comes up. No. Mass production. Well, mass production is both of these. I think um, Dell. Dell was a big leader in this. You know when Dell came out. What's so bit, so different about Dell than any other computer maker? They can custom make it. Again. They custom made it. So mass customization. So now instead of saying, "Here's what we make," you buy it or just leave me alone. They said, "What do you want?" Oh yeah, I can make that exactly like you want. It. And if you want something different, I'll make yours exactly like you want. It. And you, I'll make it like you want. It. Um, so at the company I used to work for, we did that too. On uh, a little bit smaller scale, we did van conversions. So we took a van, made it into little motor homes. <clears throat> and we had a base model that we did. The 
Here it is. This was our standard model. And so this is the one, we had, a, we had one line that all it did was make these. They made standard models, but even the standard model, they could put different stuff in it. They could say, I want everything except for, I want that to be a little bit different, or change this, or I want this thing on it. <clears throat> and then, but they could also pick anything else. Um, and then they could also go in and say, so they, these, were all, these were all standard plans. So they could say, I want an EV82. So we had patterns set up for all that. But they could also say, I want to do it myself. And it would give them a basic outline of the van. They'd say, hmm, I want that galley on. I want it on that side. Uh, no, really. One on that side, and I want it to be right there. And then I want want that cabinet. I want two of those there. I want a couple more over here. So this side I want all cabinets. They could pick out exactly what they wanted, and we had another line that would make it exactly like they wanted. So that one line, the standard model one line, the custom model. <clears throat> Some of them would be just like, okay, all I want is a chair in the back. I don't want any cabinets, I don't want anything, I just want captain's chair, I want six captain's chairs back there. Or just, I want all cabinets. Or I want this thing. Um, or, and then we had other options and things, but then people could bring their own stuff and say, I want this in it. It's like, we all stock that. Well, I want it, okay. Well, we'll put it in for you. I'll go find where to buy it. Where they bring in something and say, here, put this in there. What's the biggest thing you got? Oh, no. I don't know, we did all kinds of stuff. We had guys bring in their custom heater setups um, to use. It actually started from a customer that we actually added as a standard option. It was uh, doing a heat exchanger off the radiator and doing a heat exchanger so that that would heat their, their water. So it had, the radiator went through it, but then also had some fresh water lines went through so that they didn't have to use a propane to heat their hot water. And then, like, hey, that's really good. We're just going to make this a standard option. So then that was one of the things on the option list. Um, was it only based on one type of model car? It was, or? we did Ford and Chevy vans, both regular and extended bodies. But then there were options on, what do they want? Do you want it four-wheel drive? Do you want it two-wheel drive? Do you want it to go four -wheel. Oh. on the four-wheel drive? They, we did our own four-wheel drive. Wasn't or you can send it down and get a four-wheel drive somewhere else. It wasn't just uh, interior, it was exterior yep. and motor? Uh-huh. Oh, we didn't do any motor stuff. Oh, right? stuff. Uh, so when but, you guys created it, but they had the right stuff? like that. But, so when they created, they had the rights to that drawing, or you guys, no, you guys was, had to give it, it to them. Thing. We, everyone wanted their own thing. If they didn't want a standard one, everyone's was different. Even the standard line, one to the next was different. So, here's just kind of an example of some of the different ones. Those are the standards. So those are all basic. This company based real. in California. What? Yeah, it, uh, actually the main office is Tennessee, but the biggest one, the biggest factory is in Fresno. So like these are all pre-owned ones. Oh, they moved over and started doing the, the Dodge too right before I left. But you can see they're all a little bit different. Some just two-wheel drive, but that's a four-wheel. The, the two-wheel drive with a different roof, four-wheel drive with no, roof, no added roof, four-wheel drive with a pop-up roof. So each one was different going down the line. So we had to know what that one needed and to get there on time so that that person could leave. And prices went between, including the van, 60 grand and some left our shop at 500 grand. To be on what they wanted inside. Was that the most? Yeah, about 500. He had about 90,000 90, AV in it. <clears throat> so, that's a big thing. So how do you how do you set up production if everything's gonna be different? What are the challenges there? 
What do you think? Yeah, I mean, having all the right parts at the right time. Yeah, making it all fit together. <clears throat> We're there. We had a, a a fit, a fixed size that we could work with, and we had to get what they wanted in that size. Sometimes we had to take our standard standard cabinets and make them bigger or smaller, just to make it fit. <clears throat> Was there codes that, uh, that you went by? No. We had a nice big checklist for all of the because we had. 60 standard options that they could pick from. Plus, then they could have their own stuff, so we had a couple lines for that. So and so they just had a thing on the thing, I mean, it's all this stuff. If we didn't have it, if it wasn't a stocked item, I had to make sure that we ordered it and got it there on time. So were you the one doing the blueprint for it? Yep. What? Were you oh. the one like, doing the designs for it? We really, it was kind of backed up. It was, it was old school. Um, the salesman guy took notes of what he wanted, drew a little hand four plan, and then they had one like that that was on paper with the cabinets and things, and they'd paste it on in the right spot before we did the computer one. Then after that, they'd draw it in and then print it out. And that was our drawing. This cabinet's going to go here, and then the counter shop is up to them to make it work. So were you also the manager for the, were you also managing the website to do it? No, I didn't. I didn't do the website there. They had the home office do that. <coughs> um, but so we had to make sure that we had what, what, what it needed. And we had to go through a list and say, okay, it needs this, 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 and this. Um, and then make sure we got the right stuff and everything. But a lot of companies are start, are, are doing that. You go and buy, you order off online, you tell it, I want this size, I want this color, and they go through and they make it that way. Um, Pelco down in Fred, or in Clovis, same thing. They have standards. But then you can also get it painted whatever color you wanted for the cameras. Or you could get custom colors depending on the volume. So if your volume was a certain level, they'd custom paint it with a liquid paint. If your volume is a little bit more, they'll custom paint it with powder coat. Because it costs a little more to get set up and stuff so they needed more volume. <clears throat> if you wanted to pay extra, no matter your volume, the the dip paint it. That's so how they get like the camouflage on it and stuff. So they, they'd set that up. So, but each thing come down could go that way. <clears throat> so questions, thoughts. Wasn't there other companies that started that? That was a, a big first one that was doing doing it. Um,